Well, I'm Robert Mann and uh, my pleasure today to be talking to the Clerk of the Senate, Harry Evans. Well, Harry, um, it's really my pleasure to uh, be able to talk to you oh, uh, about, to about the Parliament and about the, the chapter. But I, I, I wondered before we uh, talked about the Parliament, uh, if you could say a little bit about how you got this rather strange job, um, Clerk of the Senate. Well, it, it's one of those jobs that uh, requires a rather esoteric knowledge, specialised knowledge, and um, there are no training courses for it. You no. get it, you get it by on the job learning, basically. Yes. By um, joining the Senate Department at some stage, and uh, then it's uh, something of an endurance test. Those that last out the distance, we hope, gain the knowledge and. Uh, and uh, go into the job. And you've been there really a very long time. I've been with the Senate Department um, 39 years, which is, uh, which is a long time, too long, and in the clerk's job for 20 years now, which is also probably too long. And, and you became clerk 1988? 1988, 1988 yeah. yeah. Now, I, don't, I know this will embarrass you for me to say it, but I, I, I've been a very great admirer of you as clerk of the Senate. Uh, and I, I want to, and it took me a while to work out why exactly. Uh, the obvious thing is, is that I've, in the comments you've made in public, I've seen how much knowledge you have of parliamentary procedure, which I think is probably un, unparalleled amongst people that I know. But also, it took me a long while to realise that you speak uh, with complete independence of the executive government when you speak. There's a sort of assumption most people have that anyone paid by taxpayers, somehow in the end are beholden to government. And it suddenly twigged that what you see yourself as, and, and just correct me if I'm wrong, is the servant not of the government of, but of the parliament, as a, and that's a completely different matter. Well, that's, that's quite right. And uh, I think I've been influenced by the culture of the Senate, which um, for long periods has not been under government control, and which yes. therefore has been able to operate as a as a house of the parliament, but at the same time has always been under attack because of that um, independence that yes. it's often had from executive government. And um, my starting point is uh, really to try to persuade people that this is um, this institution is not necessarily being obstructive and not necessarily violating democracy, but is actually doing what parliaments were originally supposed to do. Uh, performing the legislative function, yes. which lower houses largely don't do because they're government controlled. Yes. And, um, I, and again, there are things I wonder about in the job, Clerk of the Senate. What's your relationship? Is it called the Clerk of the House of Representatives? Oh, yes. Is yes, that yes, yes. What, what's the sort of relationship at a working level that you have with Clerk of the Representatives? Well, that's a very different job, simply because the um, House of Representatives has a very different culture. Uh, it's a culture um, framed by government control, the government always having a majority, and what the government wants goes. In yes. the House of Representatives. So, so it's a very different uh, job. Um, in the Senate, you uh, spend more time advising non-government people and and occasionally, government backbenchers as yes. well, um, how they can exercise the traditional legislative functions of scrutinising government and amending legislation and those traditional legislative functions. So um, it is a very different job. There's because of the for, culture of the... The culture makes it a different job because the Senate yes. is more likely to be yes. not under control of government. Yes, that, that, that's... Has that's there been a long-standing... Right clerk of the House of Representatives, or has that position changed frequently? Uh, no, clerks of the House have also lasted a fairly long time, um, um, more frequently in recent years. Um, but um, it, it is a, a completely different job. I think, I think they see their job as um, preserving the procedures of the House to the maximum extent yes. that you can, given yes. that the government wants to ram its business through and it usually gets its way. Uh, whereas in the Senate, um, you're reviving traditional parliamentary procedures all the time for, for the use of 
people who are interested in holding government accountable and looking closely at legislation and doing all those traditional legislative things. Does, it, does that culture of holding government accountable even extend to, let's say, the President of the Senate, who is always, uh, I take it, a representative of the governing party or parties? The, the, the convention is that the President comes from the party that forms the government, uh, which is not usually the majority party in the Senate. Yes. Um, but I think because in the Senate over long periods no party has had a majority, uh, I think that's um, influenced the presidency. It's, it's exercised in a different way. It's done on a more consultative basis. Uh -huh. And the tendency is for the uh, president to be more um, independent and more impartial because of that. And has that always worked in, in, in reality? Uh, I, th I, think it, I think it works most of the time, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, the president, and, and a former president said this to me, the president, being a member of the government party, is always under great pressure to do what the government party would like done. Yes. But, um, and speakers are under that pressure also, but I think the president has a defence against that in, in so far as um, you know, normally the party of government doesn't hold a majority. And the president can say, well, look, that's all very well, but, um, you know, I have to consult with the other parties because... Yes. You know. Now, I mean, I see you just because I, th I think, you know, from time to time you speak and give interviews and speak about issues before the parliament. I see you as the most conspicuous defender of the parliamentary system uh, that we have, really. And I, uh, I wondered whether there is a sort of any association that you have with, let's say, state parliamentary, I don't know what they're called, but clerks of councils and assemblies, or whether you know you, you act really kind of alone. Is there a culture of those who defend the parliamentary tradition from the inside, as it were? Yes, um, and it's found in state upper houses where governments have not had majorities for a long period of yes. time. Uh, particularly the um, New South Wales Legislative Council um, since it was reformed many years ago and the government of the day has not had a majority for long periods. Um, I find that my colleagues in those sort of upper houses around the country are performing similar roles and have similar interests and write and say similar things. Uh -huh. And there's communication between you and... Oh yes, indeed, yes. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. And again, I haven't read anything about it or known about mm. how this all operates, but I... I it's, not, it's not very conspicuous. Yes. Mm. But it, it... And so that there, there is a kind of um, a conversation going on about how... Yes. The, what's happening mm. in the general culture of the parliament yeah, over yeah, time. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you begin the chapter that you've written, dear Mr Rudd, by saying that, that in recent times, and you don't link it to one government, but in recent times, the parliament has been in many ways subverted and by the power of executive government. And obviously, I want to talk about many different aspects of that sort of subversion and the, the controls that have come. Do you, do you think it's, it's been a steady progress in which executive government has more and more been irritated and not understood the idea of a, of a parliament as a really autonomous institution? Yes, it's been a long process, um, and um, it, it, it started to arise when the Labor Party uh, became a majority party for the first time, which you know takes us back to 1910, um, because of the solidarity which they carried into politics, yes. um, and because um, they viewed upper houses particularly as you know obstacles to great social reform and so on. Um, and the, the non-Labor parties over a long period were compelled into to copy that party discipline and, and yes. to gradually become more cohesive. For a long time, uh, members of the non-Labor parties um, at least paid lip service to the ideals of parliamentary government. They, they would say to themselves, you know, we are members of parliament, we are not members yes. of the executive, we are independent of the executive, we don't do what the executive tells us. But um, over a long period, they have become uh, just as disciplined as the 
as the Labor Party has yes. always traditionally been, and that, that is particularly so uh, in the last uh, 15 years or so. Which spans both the late part of the Labor Port Keating years and the yes. Howard years. Yes, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very rough sort of um, estimate, but at some stage around that time, um, I think the um, non-Labor backbenchers tended to lose that um, traditional view of their independence. Yes. I mean, I can remember, you know, in, in my own observation of Parliament back to, let's say, or certainly back to the Fraser years, and it seems to me then there was always a body of backbenchers, particularly, I think you're right, on the coalition side, <coughs> who just assumed that being a parliamentarian was not supporting a government in all circumstances. And that seems to have gone. Yes, I, th I think that's right. Um, there were always certainly um, coalition senators who said to themselves, well, we're not here just to do what the government tells us. And uh, all, all votes on our side are free votes. Yes. There's no such thing as being bound by the party discipline. But, but also, um, on the other side of the major party divide, there were, there were people who, uh, you know, while they were bound by the caucus decision, in, once they got into the chamber, they were bound by the caucus decision. They certainly had a greater degree of um, independence, I think, and yes. would use every means available to them to exercise yes. it. Let's... You know, you've written this chapter, and, and I assume that even though you, you have watched the, the growing subversion of an autonomous or independent parliament, you do have hopes that the trajectory can be reversed, or at least you'd like that to be the case. I'll ask you at the end whether you, how hopeful you are that real changes can be made. And you say at the beginning of the chapter that parliament has three fundamental kind of roles. One is legislative, one is inquisitorial, and the other is to make government accountable to it. so, and I'd like to talk in a way, or take you through those different those different functions of, of the parliament. But I'll take it through in a very concrete way and ask you for your sort of both what you've observed over time and and hey, what you think uh, can be done about it. Let's take one of the I think with ordinary audience audiences the most kind of visible part of parliament question time. Mm. What do you think it happens in question time now? Well, it's, it's political theatre. It's, it's um, the uh, opposition parties, and particularly the, the main opposition party, trying to um, make a minister stumble, um, make a minister look like a fool. Uh, if you can make them stumble over a question, you know, that that's adds to the political score. Um, and if you can identify a minister that's particularly weak and um, doesn't know his or her brief and so on, you can make them stumble repeatedly, well, you, you know, you've scored something politically. Um, but um, uh, basically it's political theatre. And I, I often think that it's played not for the benefit of the general public because we know that the general public don't watch it for the most part, mm. but it's played for the, the party supporters out there who... Who are looking the, for their the team. Part, the party it. faithful, yes, yes, who are following their team. Mm. And it's a sort of sport then. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. One team. But, yes. I mean, ha you also say you think it's pretty easy for question time to become, you know, what it ought to be, which is a way in which ministers are made accountable um, to the parliament. How, how can it... Well, if you read the, the standing orders of, of the, containing the rules about question time and you read the the um, rulings from the chair over many years about question time, you find that uh, questions should be questions and, and they should relate to matters of ministerial responsibility and answers should be answers and they should be responsive and they should be relevant and there should be no debate um, and so on. Yes. You know, if, if all those rules were adhered to, question time would be a great accountability mechanism. Yes, and that, would that, re that really requires incredibly courageous speakers well, yes, residents. and and it would require the cooperation of everybody in the chamber. Um, it couldn't be it couldn't be initiated by the president or the speaker. Well, well, it could, yes, and uh, and I think speakers in the past, have, both at state level and federal level, have attempted to do this to uh, get question time back to a, 
a question and answer session, but they really need the cooperation of the all, all the members of the parties to do that. And I think the great barrier to it is that the parties are not willing to give up the political theatre. You know, mm. this, is, this, is, this is part of their political game, part yeah. of their political operations, and um, why should they give that up? I think probably they'd say, well, there are other places where we can ask real questions and try to get real answers. Um, you know, we want to keep this uh, political bun fight. Yeah. We like it. Now, obviously, allied with the question of question time and reliant upon it is the, the independence of the speaker and what's happened to that. I just wondered partly whether you think um, the, the speaker has lacked independence in your experience of the parliament. I'm, I suppose we're particularly thinking about the House of Representatives. And then I'd like to see what you think can be done to give more robustness to the speaker's position in a way that I think, say, Westminster has more than we do. Yes, I, th I think uh, speakers overall uh, have not been as independent as they should be and have not been as impartial as they should be. Um, I think that's not because they've been bad people. I think it's because of the enormous pressure that's put on them by their party colleagues, uh, particularly over question time. Yeah. Um, if a minister does something that facilitates the stumbling of a minister, well, they're not, they're not very popular with their party. Yeah. And um, I think it's very, very difficult for them to resist that pressure. Um, so I think um, an ind a more independent speaker and a more impartial speaker requires a, a culture change on the part of the parties, um, a determination on the part of the parties and particularly leaders to set the lead to have a more independent chair and a more impartial Do you chair. see any, any sign of a shift in the culture? Well, so there's been a lot of um, noise about, well, I wouldn't say noise, there's been a lot of uh, statements about the desirability yeah. of doing this. And um, I think um, you know, it's early days with the uh, new government and uh, the, certainly the current speaker has um, said, uh, expressed an intention to you know, try and uh, make the position more as it should wouldn't, be. Wouldn't that happen with every new government? Well, this is the problem, yes. <laughs> I think uh, quite a few governments have come into office with the promise of improving the parliamentary process and uh, um, making question time more valuable and improving the independence of the speaker. Um, but you have to wait and see whether that happens. Yes, and the, and the test is when real pressure comes on the government and, and the speaker can then do yeah. harm or not, I suppose. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Now, um, again, I want to talk about concrete things, and one of the, the issues you discuss in the chapter is, is the question of, of the accountability, the, fin the financial accountability that the Parliament should exercise in, in government expenditure. And I have to say, as a, as a citizen, I've been increasingly shocked, really shocked, at the, the, the um, development of government expenditure on party political purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, to, and the obvious one, that the most recent, is work choices and the vast advertising campaign. But it goes back to the to the Hawke Keating years as well. So it's, I do think it's got worse myself as a taxpayer. And I've actually wondered um, why it is that the Australian population is, has been so meek in regard to that, because of, it's, it seems to me one of the most obvious abuses I've seen in political life and one that I would have thought more citizens would be aroused by. But anyhow, that's my <laughs> sermon. Um, but I just wonder, is there anything that, I mean, I know from your chapter that you agree that, that it is a bad thing, but is there anything that can practically be done to prevent governments using taxpayers' money to strengthen their hand through advertising? Well, the, the parliament has to do it. Uh, I mean, the, the parliament at some stage has to establish proper processes for uh, making government advertising properly directed to some legitimate advertising role and impartial. Yeah. Um, and um, that won't be done unless there's public pressure. Uh, I think there needs to be more public outrage about the, the um, nature of government advertising. Yes. And I think um, the um, occasions that you've mentioned, the development over the last few years, uh, may well lead to some um, 
pinning back of the misuse of advertising in, in the coming years. You said something very interesting in the chapter, which is that you think there was a kind of broad hint from the Chief of the Chief Justice of the High Court, Gleeson, that really inviting the Parliament to try and f find a way of binding or preventing government misdemeanour in this area. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about that? Well, this was in the, the government advertising case, as it's called, in, in which the Labor Party sought to have the High Court declare that um, all the spending on um, advertising, particularly on the uh, Work Choices campaign, uh, was not in accordance with the parliamentary appropriation. In other words, it wasn't the purpose for which the appropriation was made by the Parliament. Now, the High Court had uh, struck down uh, some government expenditure back in 1990 on the basis that it was not authorised by the parliamentary appropriation. The trouble is that since that time, um, the parliamentary appropriations have been streamlined, so-called, um, in a supposed great reform of the financial system, which people didn't really realise the implications yeah. of until it was too late, um, whereby um, departments now have two or three outcomes, which are really vaguely expressed goals, and the money is appropriated to uh, those vaguely expressed goals. And basically what the Chief Justice said was, well, if you, the Parliament, are so negligent, he didn't use that word, but he said, if you, the Parliament, see fit to appropriate huge sums of money to these vaguely expressed outcomes, um, then you can't complain if the, if the money is spent on things you haven't expected. And uh, he went on to say, no doubt the, um, the vaguer are the purposes for which the money is appropriated, the more the Parliament will insist on being provided with details of the purposes of the expenditure. And that was a, you know, a very broad hint that, that they should. They should. And they haven't. Well, not yet, but yes. uh, there's some hope that uh, something will happen. So what's actually the answer, do you think, in practical terms as to how appropriation well, can be made more specific? Well, my answer is to abandon the system of appropriating for outcomes and go back to the system of appropriating for programs and projects. Yes. Um, now, the, the um, uh, bureaucrats will say, oh, no, it's too, too inflexible. You know, you've got money appropriated for this purpose. You can't transfer it to some other purpose, but, but there are mechanisms for transferring money with um, parliamentary oversight. And um, I think we have to get back to uh, people being able to see in the appropriation bills the purposes for which the money is appropriated. Yes. And then, if it's uh, expended on unexpected purposes, it could well be illegal. Uh -huh. At the moment, um, virtually no expenditure would be unlawful because the appropriations are so vague. And then, apart from the annual appropriations, the government has um, enormous sums of money available to it from other sources as well. But, but I, I, I'm trying to understand this, but if, if it's culturally acceptable, seen to be acceptable for a government, a Howard government, to try and get back into office by running an advertising campaign making unpopular legislation seem a good thing, spending hundreds of millions, why could they not then just pass, you know, have specific appropriations for, for advertising for work choices legislation? Well, the, the problem with the, the um, particular program that was taken to court was that we, we hadn't seen the legislation. The legislation was still being drafted. It hadn't even been introduced into the parliament. And um, to spend money on advertising something that nobody has ever seen. Yes. That was the same Support. actually with the, the um, tax changes and uh, yes. the introduction yes. of the yes. goods um, and services tax. But, um, you know, if, if your um, appropriation said something like, and the, the, the documentation which underlies the appropriation and which is legally part of it, um, said, you know, for advertising government programs which have been approved by the Parliament, well, that would put a stop to that, yes. that uh, dodge anyway. Yes. Although it wouldn't put a stop to then advertising after you've passed legislation, um, unpopular no. legislation which, which you're trying to sell to the public as a good thing. No, that's, that's uh, true. And that gets back to the point that some process has to be put in place of 
um, impartial arm's length determination yeah. of government. And Through advisor. something like the Audit Commission? Or yes, yes, the, um, the Audit Office. Or, audit Office, yeah. Or some, um, you know, impartial body like that. Yeah. Because I think it, I mean, it, it, it has definitely increased public cynicism about the political process, those kinds of things. Well, the, I think the public cynicism is valuable. It should it's followed up with public outrage yes. and public pressure. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's some hope that something may be done uh, in the next few years about that. Uh -huh.